So, John, you are one of the ambassadors for Braver Angels, who work on conversations across the political divide. And one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you now is because we seem we've had the election. It was a lot closer than people thought it was going to be. The general sense that a lot of people have is that whatever, uh, however we move forward from here, there's going to have to be some kind of dialogue across political divides. Do you want to talk a little bit about what Braver Angels does and where you think we're at politically right now and whether you think the mission of the organization is more relevant than it was before? Right. Well, I think that the mission of the organization only becomes more relevant with the with the passing of, of time. Of course, we'd like to get to the point to where perhaps that that changes and the mission can evolve to something a little bit um can evolve to something less immediately concerned with pre uh, preventing uh, a chaotic sort of civil fracturing, uh, if you will. But what the organization does is, so Braver Angels is the largest grassroots bipartisan Amer uh, organization in America dedicated to the work of political depolarization. But I would like to define that in a way that goes beyond simply tamping down the hostility and goes more into reestablishing uh, a culture of citizenship in the United States of America that is rooted in a framework of what you might think of as civic friendship, of goodwill between Americans that allows us to rebuild the social fabric that is the edifice of democracy and civil society. And in that way, set the stage for the stabilizing of our institutions uh, and the reclaiming um, of a culture of dialogue that is able to sort of bring forth uh, the nobler aspects of character in the American people. That's not usually my bumper sticker explanation, but since this is rebel wisdom, I figure it might be okay to, to range out a little bit. We have workshops dedicated to, uh, to sort of showcasing the internal dialogue of your partisan opposites in a way that builds empathy, and we have debate and other formats that are more focused on the discussion of, is of issues in a polemical, but still sort of community building sort of context. And um, within the larger scope of where we are at as a political society right now in the aftermath of the 2000 and 2020 election, I think that what we've just witnessed is something of a shift in American, um, in American political, the American political mood to where for as much as the larger acrimony of our politics was driven by partisan extremes on each end of the equation, something has happened to where I think the ultimate outcome of the election is one that is testifying to the fact that I think the American people left and right, broadly speaking, really do want to see a re-embrace of some level of I was going to say normalcy, but a, a return to some to some um, culture of norms, if, if you will, a reclaiming of norms in our discourse um, that can stabilize the body politic, even as nobody was really content with the institutional status quo that preceded this moment. Nevertheless, we have found ourselves in a moment to where after four years of Donald Trump and after witnessing the near rise of Bernie Sanders and the Democratic uh, Party and the populist upheavals across the spectrum, in spite of all of that, there's a degree to which uh, the 2020 election has seen the establishment sort of return to power in some nominal uh, degree. Uh, Joe Biden is it seems the president-elect, uh, no more establishment figure in the Democratic Party. Mitch McConnell remains or will at least likely remain, uh, although we don't know yet the outcome of the Senate races in Georgia, but Mitch McConnell, at least at this moment, may very well remain as majority leader in the United States uh, Senate. Um, it shows us that on the one hand, the American people have wanted serious change in our system, uh, on the other hand, I think that we would like to see that change take place without it sacrificing our ability to actually function and cohere together uh, as a democratic community, if you will. And so the outcome of this election seems to be a compromise that maybe nobody's going to be completely happy about, uh, but that points to this tension uh, in, our, in our societal aspirations uh, in terms of the 
character of democracy that we seek to cultivate uh, at this period of time. And so Braver Angel's work evolves in that context, I think, um, to deepen the relationships that need to be fortified in order for us to sort of build a, uh, a landscape of democracy that can approach the balancing of those tensions in that way. Um, but I do think that our work in this current climate becomes uh, only more complicated because in a sense, it is not clear what direction anything is going in. All that's clear is that we have reached a, a moment of resetting. And so we have to now see what that reset begins to look like. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to talk about in a second is I'm really interested in this topic of mediation. And I think there's a lot of interest in uh, the, the, among other people who've been on Rebel Wisdom and this kind of area of the what has been called kind of the sense-making web. It's like the hard problem of the culture war is this idea of mediation. And one of the things, one of the reasons I was interested to talk to you is that mediation comes up a lot and it, it, itself it can be a kind of polarizing thing as in it seems that it shows up far more on the liberal side of the spectrum than it does on the conservative side of the spectrum. But you, would, you uh, are a self-described conservative, braver angels make sure that you have a mix of liberals and conservatives at every level of the organization, which I think is, makes it kind of, kind of unique. But one thing I wanted to do before we dive into that is to ask, there's a few people who've talked about that what we're actually seeing is no longer just a kind of red-blue, left-right split. We're actually seeing, seeing more of a sort of po multipolar war. Some of the most uh, vitriolic debates now are within the camps that you might have thought about between sort of the Trump and the never Trumpers on the right or um, the you saw sort of the battle within some of the, the liberal papers like Barry Weiss against the New York Times. Like it does seem that it is more fragmented than just a red blue thing. How, how would, would, would you agree with that? And, and how do you think that changes the, the landscape if so? Yeah, I think that there's a tremendous amount of truth in that observation. And actually, it, it ties into the broader analysis that I was uh, seeking to articulate here, uh, because there is a way in which um, there's a way in which you can perceive the outcome of the 2020 election as the most conspicuously radical elements within each coalition actually having lost in some sense. Right. Um, though each can each will have lost in a way that will still allow them to claim that they have have won in some sense that seems plausible and so obviously it seems as if donald trump himself is uh on his way out the door and yet he scored more votes than any republican uh presidential nominee uh in american history right and by a wide margin so he remains this towering influence in the party while losing his official seat of power on the other hand, on the, um, on the Democratic side, um, you have this consensus, well, at least among uh, some of the more established commentators and leaders within the, within the party and its orbit saying that the thing that prevented the blue wave from really, uh, from really crashing impactfully across the congressional map was the fact that uh, the rallying of the progressive base behind um, the defunding of police departments in America uh, around the application of critical race theory uh, throughout our institutions, the, the advent of anti-racism and identity politics and sort of a wide uh, menu of social um, attitudes translating into activists and policy pushes that frighten many of the American people. It allows for the establishment to, of the Democratic Party, I think, to be able to say, and people who are more moderate and center left and um, liberal without being a part of the establishment, because there are many of those folks, on the one hand, it allows for folks to say, well, look, this radical social justice approach uh, is harming us politically and needs to be de-emphasized. On the other hand, progressives within the party uh, and people who are more towards the social justice um, um, Bayes can say, look, uh, Joe Biden was running against the most deeply hated president in American history or recent American history. And uh, he ultimately has won the election by, you know, by not a landslide, by by a significant amount, perhaps, but not enough uh, to have uh, to have uh, vanquished Trump and Trumpism from the electoral map the way folks would like to see uh, take place uh, on that side. And so on each side, 
this sets the stage for an internal party uh, collision that, again, just to your point, um, is one that on either side may prove to be at least as, at least as um, frictious as the straight across uh, left-right uh, uh, polar divide, um, if not potentially more so. Because again, on the level of governance, the establishment has come back to, to power. Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell have known each other probably literally for 30 or 40 years or so, if not, if not longer. There is an axis of, you know, um, establishment solidarity, if you will, there that, you know, on the upside uh, could maybe stabilize some things and reintroduce some regular order to Congress, although I wouldn't take that for granted. Um, nevertheless, within the parties, within the Republican Party, you know, never Trump Republicans will seek to come back into the fold. You will have conservatives and Republicans who seek to retain some of Trump's appeal to his base, but also seek to present a more mature face to the rest of the electorate and maybe try and do business in, in different ways. Um, you'll see all sorts of balances being struck on both sides to cross the bridge between the established vehicles of power on the one hand and the bases of the uh, party on the other. And so, yeah, I think that um, that observation is, um, you know, likely to be a prophetic one. Yeah. And I, I guess the the American election is really consequential for the rest of the world as well. I'm also interested in like what are the lessons that you've learned that are applicable everywhere, not just to the American political map. And I, I remember, I think it was in the, the interview that you did with Brett, where you talked about that you're effectively using marriage guidance uh, techniques. Is, is that correct? And could you, I'd love if you could just pull apart like in detail what it is that you do in the workshops and whether what lessons we can learn from that for all kinds of conflicts. Sure. So there are different types of uh, workshops that we that we do. Um, so the thing that was originally covered in Braver Angels work was something referred to as a red blue workshop. So this is a model where we take small groups of individuals from the left and from the right, blues and reds, as we say in house. Uh, not to argue or debate politics, but to speak from the perspective of their own personal experience in terms of why they see politics the way that they do. And so, again, literally the application of marriage counseling techniques to the relationships between Republicans and Democrats. In this particular program, <clears throat> it begins with an exercise where you take each side and you split the room. And so after an initial sort of round of introductions, each group uh, goes to another room with a, uh, with a moderator uh, who will guide them in the process of compiling a list of stereotypes. And these are the stereotypes that they see the other side as having about them. And so in the case of Reds, conservatives, Republicans, uh, libertarians, uh, that list will usually start with with uh, something like, well, the other side thinks that we're racist. Maybe they think that we hate poor people, that we hate science, on and on down. Uh, with the blue side, you'll have a list that frequently starts with something like, oh, the other side thinks that we hate America. They think that we want the government to run everybody's lives, that we want to take everybody's freedoms away, that we, that we mooch off the state, et cetera, et cetera. Then each side gets the opportunity to come back uh, together and to present their list to the other side and to explain why they think these stereotypes are wrong. But they're also asked to refer to, to acknowledge whether or not they see a kernel of truth in any or all of the stereotypes that they assemble. And, and so generally speaking, each side does. And conservatives will say, well, uh, we, are not, we are not racist by and large. Being conservative doesn't make you racist, but that doesn't mean you don't have racists who have hitched their wagon to the Republican Party, and we ought to be sensitive to that, and make the party less open to, or make them less comfortable um, in our party. Democrats will frequently say, well, you know, you do have some folks who have, uh, um, we are critical, but we are still patriots, but you do have some folks in our ranks who maybe are not generous enough uh, to America, some people who really do sort of, you know, uh, borderline hate their country, perhaps, or we have people who game the welfare uh, system and who, you know, otherwise, uh, otherwise, um, you know, take advantage of the state. And so we invite reflection, right? We, we um, give people the opportunity to hear from each other 
um, within the space of their own internal dialogue, as opposed to having the character of our political opposites represented to us through, through the distorting lens of a partisan media, right? Or media that is otherwise invested in a uh, model uh, of, in a business model that's, you know, uh, that is rooted in a need to polarize in order to be successful. And obviously that has direct consequences for how it is we, we come by our knowledge, how it is we think, how it is we make sense of the world. I'll give you another little example. We have an exercise called a, um, a fishbowl um, where uh, each group, and this is a fairly common mediation technique, group mediation technique, but there's something called a fishbowl where you take one group, let's say the conservative side, they have a conversation amongst themselves about why it is they're conservative, what experiences led them to, to feel the way they do about politics, while the other side listens silently from the outside. So the reds will have a conversation on the inside of the fishbowl, the blues will quietly just listen and observe from the outside. And then each side switches, right? And um, only after going through those sorts of exercises do we then allow each side to begin communicating directly with the moderator. So what might the people on the inside be talking about, the, the conversation that's being observed? Sure. So they're talking about, you know, why it is they're conservative, why it is they're progressive. And so there'll be a moderator that asks prompting questions. But, you know, what is it about the conservative philosophy that resonates with your beliefs? For example, and participants on the inside of the fishbowl may speak about their religious convictions. They may talk about the way their families raise them to be to be uh, uh, self sufficient, uh, to uh, always be um, uh, loyal to uh, to their to their family, to their business, to whatever their affiliations uh, may be. Progressives may talk about their experiences uh, being marginalized in a certain social setting or being taken advantage of by an employer as a laborer or what have you. One way or another, it's all about the articulating of experiences that have led to the formulation of our worldviews, right? Um, and so after that phase of the workshop, then we begin to go into a period where after some sustained exposure, to this internal dialogue on the other side. A moderator will give each party the opportunity to question and engage with one of their political opposites in a conversation about issues. But even then there's a little bit of guidance in the area of helping us to formulate questions to each other that actually pull out honest reflections as opposed to triggering uh, defensive or hostile reactions. So one thing that's interesting to observe in this context is the fact that when it comes to political conversations, many of us don't actually know how to have dialogues uh, when we are conspicuously confronted with a political opposite that doesn't lean on language that is loaded to the degree of sabotaging, you know, um, reasonable conversation. And so a progressive might want to know in this uh, in a in a workshop like this. A progressive might want to ask a conservative or, or Republican here, um, you know, uh, why do you believe that uh, uh, women don't have the right to decide what to do with their own bodies? You know, well, this is the person just really the, what's at the bottom of that question is a desire to understand why the conservative feels the way he does about abortion. But when a person has been so preloaded with only sort of stigmatized ways of articulating that concept, right? It's hard for them to articulate that question in a way that isn't received by the other person as a bit of an as an attack, right? Oh, wait a second. This isn't about me, you know, wanting to control women's bodies. This is about well, me. Why, to... why do you want to take our guns away or something like that? It's exactly. already framed yeah. in a precisely. And so the moderator is there to help people frame their questions uh, in a way that you know invites curiosity and responsiveness, and that ultimately seeks to you know, articulate the other person's point of view in language that they themselves would resonate. So instead of why do you want to control, you know, uh, women's bodies, you know, um, uh, what makes you, um, what makes you um, believe that the right to life for uh, an unborn child uh, is, is more important than um, a, a woman's uh, being able to choose what to do with her body, right? 
Um, and so it's still a tense subject, but it points to the moral foundation that the other person is actually acting or thinking from, which is this view that the unborn life is sacred, right? And so it lets... And I know I think many people watching will probably be aware of Jonathan Haidt's work as well. I know that you rely a lot on, on, on that, the idea of the moral matrices. What I wanted yeah, to pick Jonathan up... Jonathan Haidt is on, the board, uh, is on our board of directors at Braver Angels, yes. If anyone hasn't seen or read that book, The Righteous Mind, I really highly recommend it. What I was going to pick up on is... I love the first exercise that you talked about, which is effectively reflecting on one's own side first. And it, it, what comes up for me is it, it sounds like shadow work. I don't know if you're familiar with the kind of idea of that, that Jordan Peterson was talking about, the Jungian idea of the shadow, which is the, the parts of ourselves we can't see. And that's, really, that's a really fascinating way of doing almost group shadow work in a political context. <laughs> sure, right. The spirit of the debate program as we facilitate it is meant to really sort of dig into the idea of intellectual honesty and intellectual humility, right? And so the focus in our debate uh, program is less about achieving a polemical victory and more about being honest and authentic about your convictions, why you see things the way that you do, but with an open invitation to people to be very honest about what it is they do not know about an issue, to be very honest about what it is they may feel to be a weakness in their own arguments, right? And to even give people the latitude to change their mind in the middle of the event on a certain subject, if they do happen to hear something from the other side that that's just that compelling to them, right? And so being able to reflect um, on our own uh, on, on our own biases, on our own uh, epistemological sorts of uh, weak spots, and really just sort of the shortcomings of our own ability to for our knowledge to keep place with our sense of certainty, to keep pace with our sense of certainty. That is uh, a subtle element of the, an undernourished element of the culture of our democracy, which we are seeking to fortify in the culture of the structures that we're building for this sort of dialogue and engagement um, in, American, uh, in American society. And so um, I've never talked about that in terms of uh, coming to grips with the Jungian shadow and so forth, but yeah, I can certainly see the connection that you're drawing and, um, you know, uh, one of the major failings of our culture as it exists today is that it simply does not allow for space for that sort of reflection to take place. And therefore, there's no room for humility, right? And that, I think, in turn leads to a culture where you have, you know, activists on the one hand who don't want to create space for, for redemption or reinvention on the part of people who seem to have socially transgressed, or you have politicians, on the other hand, uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, our current president in particular, who has embraced a style of political leadership where in uh, uh, humility and a willingness to apologize, a willingness to uh, repent for mistakes is actually uh, looked at as a vice and, and not a virtue, right? And so these are the sorts of cultural trends that arise um, when the structure of our virtues uh, begin to crack and dissolve in key places. And we see the consequences here of the uh, sort of uh, putting aside of humility and, and, and repentance and reconciliation as virtues. Um, as those things have drifted by the wayside, these other patterns have emerged and have become stronger. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that. Yeah, and I had this question for a bit later on, but I might, it just feels appropriate now. You've, I think you've talked about Trump as a symptom of the system rather than a cause, and that it, it sort of points up to some of the issues with the, um, I mean, how would you say that? Is it, is it sort of the, the, the decay of the system that he took advantage of, or what do you, how, how do you see it? Yes, um, I think that President Trump took advantage of trends that were already fairly deeply rooted in our um, in our political psychology, and that became uh, an avenue to to power for the president. You know, I don't want to uh, reduce it to Trump's only having played on our divisions. He also spoke to the fact that there's a significant 
uh, portion of the American electorate that was not really spoken to in a direct and meaningful way by the establishments of either party, but was also also sort of actively culturally reviled by the cultural elites in our society. You know, your working class white folks in Rust Belt America uh, do not represent a, or, you know, your traditional um, conservative and religious uh, people who aren't going through the university system or, 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 or experiencing life through integrated cosmopolitan or multicultural uh, suburbs and so forth. Uh, these are people who uh, popular American uh, culture and uh, both on the level of arts and, and uh, academia actively sort of seeks to disassociate itself from and to sort of hide as we present an American face uh, to the rest of the world. And so, you know, Trump spoke to those people in a way that I think seemed to come across as having an authentic kind of interest and connection with um, with their, not just their grievances, but their desire to be recognized and loved and accepted. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not so cynical as to think that there is nothing sincere in that. Um, and so I, I, I want to be open-minded to the idea that Donald Trump actually spoke on a certain level, a human language that some people resonated with. But even at that, um, that is something that he would only have an opportunity to do in the context of a broader societal kind of cultural fracture within which, you know, uh, some major parts of the American electorate are not represented um, within the cultural uh, mainstream mainstream uh, of of an evolving kind of narrative of diversity and inclusivity, which includes folks from every different color, but puts aside uneducated white folks who don't possess a liberal pedigree. And it's ironic because that narrative itself kind of mirrors the narrative of grievance that a lot of folks within the social justice camp themselves feel as people coming from communities of color, marginalized communities, so on and so forth, who don't see themselves represented in the mainstream of the historical narrative of what the United States of America uh, is. And so um, into all of that, Donald Trump rode as something of a savior and something of a uh, of 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 an anti messiah sort of sort of um, archetype, perfectly situated to uh, and perfectly sort of designed in in many respects to to play that part within the existing narrative currents that were already in motion in each hemisphere of our national uh, psychology. And so, uh, yes, I, I do believe that he emerges as a symptom of these broader trends. Having said that, you know, it's also fair to say that these these currents uh, carried into power a, a man who uh, himself, you know, um, has long embodied a lot of these, uh, you know, a, a lot of these deeper disintegrations in our cultural in our cultural norms, and so. You know, um, he is not the he's not the cause, but he is very uh, illuminating uh, as a symptom. Coleman Hughes, in his discussion with John McWhorter, talked about and they were talking about the topic of race. And obviously that's one of the most sort of difficult polarizing topics in America. And, and Coleman raised it as a question. And John McWhorter, as an atheist, was was kind of reluctant to go there. But I think Coleman was 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 musing on whether one needed Martin Luther King was able to do what he did because he was a religious believer. He was able to hold up a narrative that was uniting beyond this earthly realm, this kind of idea of, um, and he was drawing on a religious tradition. Do, and you sort of touched on that a minute ago with like, do we need that kind of narrative? Do we need that kind of unifying story? So, you know, I think I'll, I appreciate your asking that question. And um, I, I'm actually tempted to answer it in a more personal way than I normally would, just because you happen to have caught me in a moment where I've been wrestling with this a little bit for myself. And um, so I am a person of faith, um, but I'm a person of faith who uh, finds it very difficult to uh, to to show up in my whole self, so to speak, to, so to speak, so to speak, to use a kind of a popular turn of phrase, you know, to show up in my, in my full authenticity, in either religious or secular 
settings because I am sort of a Petersonian sort of <laughs> Christian uh, at at bottom. I mean, I see reality through um, uh, through decidedly uh, evolutionary terms, and and yet I, I do so. Uh, through the narrative architecture of many traditions, but at the core, but the core tradition there is is ultimately an Abraham, Abrahamic one and a Christian one, um, specifically, right? I think that in theory you can say that you do not need organized religion uh, in order to satisfy the religious impulse in human society. I think theoretically you can say that. Um, rationally, it holds up. But I'm not sure if it holds up um, in in deeper reality. Um, so the thing is, is that I, I think that one of the dangers of the materialist perspective is that it seeks to collapse everything into the articulable, or at least many people approach it in that, in that way. Um, but there are components of the human mind, of the human consciousness, and, and really just, I think, a majority of how we go through life experiencing reality and, and even um, so much of how we communicate with one another goes beyond, goes beyond the articulable, even if it is not necessarily or by definition unavailable to the articulable, as you start to narrow in on any particular aspect of sort of uh, a human beings and humanity's collective kind of intuitive architecture. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, I think that we derive meaning from having something that either is or is like a teleological sense of where we belong in the social structure of humanity and in the larger structure of reality that allows us to marshal the sort of full arsenal of our characters in executing our own particular roles in reality, however those are defined. And so if I'm a father, I am a husband, I am a citizen of the United States of America, these represent different roles uh, that I have in a societal landscape uh, through, which, through which whatever virtues of character I have ultimately express themselves. And you can reference the work of Alistair McIntyre in sort of getting uh, uh, a book called After Virtue, I, I, would, I would recommend, and getting a deeper ex explication of the relationship between virtue and, and role and the kind of need for something like a teleological structure for, for allowing these things to manifest in our fuller understanding. But then there is an aspect to me as a human creature which puts me in dialogue with the reality of mortality and with a larger sort of imaginative kind of experience of the world wherein we all see things we all see we all we all see in our imaginations uh pictures and sensory representations of the past of the present of the future of the things that other people are thinking and feeling that go unsaid that paint within us something of a working map for reality that crosses across uh, just a massive breadth of abstractions that nevertheless resonate within us in felt ways that we then repackage and express in words, <laughs> right? And you know, there becomes this space of the human mind that is spoken externally where we enter into dialogue and we think together and we try and ground our ex our, our articulations of reality uh, in empirical foundations that can allow us to manipulate and interact with the material world around us in a way that, you know, allows us to do specific things. But it doesn't eliminate this larger kind of, you know, breadth of the human experience that is governing sort of so much of our lived realities, so to speak, from day to day. And so um, part of my role in life is as you know, as as a whether as a father, whether as a public uh, figure or intellectual, whether as a, you know one as a friend, you know, um, I am somebody who uh, was born and who will die, who has to contemplate the implications of human existence, 
And part of my role is if I am seeking the integrated well-being of all humanity is to communicate an understanding of reality that can allow us to travel from birth to death in a way to where we can accept the ultimate finality of human existence in a way that carries with it at least the possibility for us to enter into death as if we were moving into an exciting new phase of life, whether we are actually going to be reborn or not, you know, because what governs our ability <clears throat> to operate uh, in an optimal fashion here in the now is very often our belief in the promise or possibility of an optimal tomorrow. And if you if you stifle that instinct in a way that says that, okay, you can motivate yourself to, to act in an optimal way today on the basis of the idea that life might be better a year from now, but you disconnect humanity, broadly speaking, from the idea that, that existence, as far as you can imagine it, can become more and more optimal as a means of grounding our kind of motivation to invest in an optimally sort of in 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 a, in a vision of reality that allows us to believe to the up to the utmost in the in the um in the potential and perhaps the the destiny of humanity to reach a higher level uh of being and therefore life quality of life to reach a, a greater phase of of um of existence across dimensions of well-being, then it introduces a sort of depressive, I think, um, kind of force on the mass psychology that keeps us from being able to imagine uh, across the breadths of what we are capable of because we increasingly see life as something that is more and more available only for the limited certainty of kind of increasingly narrower and more material based um, sources of sources of deeper satisfaction, sources of deeper fulfillment, so on and so forth. You cut off the spiritual vocabulary, you cut off the theological vocabulary. Um, and this larger kind of capacity we have to see ourselves as perfectly integrated into a model of design disappears. But having said that, that doesn't mean that it is not possible for us in a secular dimension. And the secular dimension exists to allow us to escape from the excesses of the religious, religious dimension that will destroy society as surely as anything, because religions themselves become massively unmoored um, from our deeper structures of virtue in society, and so too, therefore, do religious narratives which is how a Donald Trump figure could arise as something uh, like, uh, you know, a figure who is treated as representing Christian virtue and some appreciation of Christian virtue that reflects the disintegration of the understanding of Christian virtue, right? Um, I'm sorry to put it like that. Um, but it is possible, even in the secular space, for us to, to develop a metaphorical appreciation for religious and spiritual narrative that allows us to preserve that vocabulary while still giving people the space uh, to to hold to whatever um, particular um, whatever particular um, sort of material understanding of reality uh, they may have that 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 is most persuasive uh, to their sense of to their sense of reason. Um, it's possible that that could that that could work, and I just wanted to put that out there because. I hope that Jordan Peterson has been gone for a little while, you know, and one thing I'd like to say uh, is that while I had the essential architecture of my particular religious and faith-based uh, perspectives before Peterson came along, he did provide a vocabulary and a larger schematic for understanding those beliefs and the interrelationship between those beliefs and the sorts of work um, that I do that not just for me, but for so many people has allowed for us to find a place of deep dialogue with folks who are, you know, from a perspective that is more atheistic, more secular, but that still seeks to be integrated. That has set the stage for an enormously fruitful and flourishing 
uh, intellectual and spiritual dialogue, which can feed into everything else we're talking about here, David. Mm -hmm. And as Peterson has had to recede from the scene, I have felt a little bit concerned that that space may be contracting again a bit. I myself, however, have not known how to speak from the vantage point of, you know, um, my larger architecture of somewhat religiously related uh, moral and spiritual intuitions in a way that sinks into dialogue with the existing sort of uh, enlightenment framework that governs the IDW space and other spaces. Um, I think largely just because, you know, there are so few bridges for that deeper conversation and and the one that Peterson had gone so far in, in building, I think is, you know, in certain places starting to collapse a little bit in part with his abstinence in part because of the stigmatization of him personally from various quarters, and in part just because of the surrounding pressures of everything else we're talking about. But taking the opportunity to, to just uh, confess here to you, I, I do think that that is, that's a deep layer to all of this, you know. Um, we need to be able to erect a structure of meaning in, in human civilizational life that doesn't sacrifice uh, sanity and a grounding in the integrity uh, in the integrity of truth, and again, both the empirical and the intuitive layer across the dimensions of our epistemology. And I I come to you as I as I do in every kind of space into which I wade into which I wade intellectually and philosophically, not as somebody who seeks to articulate sort of a full answer, but rather somebody who seeks to articulate the fullness of what I and my subjectivity feel within in the hopes that in a larger teleological construct, whether that be literal or metaphorical, that I and what I feel and believe can find my optimal place in relation to what it is you feel and believe and who it is you are and what it is, what role it is that you play, uh, you know, within this larger construct. And so that's probably taking the answer a bit farther than <laughs> you had intended for me to go. I, I appreciate you letting me go on at some, at some length there. Yeah. Well, you've, you've given, um, and maybe, maybe we'll, th this is quite a big question, but you've, you've kind of opened up this territory and I think it's really the, the fruitful territory, like the, the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson, I think really spoke to the depth of the meaning crisis what a lot of people have called the meaning crisis or the meta crisis. And I think you've said before that we're philosophically starving. And I think that's, that's true. And I'd love if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, but also tie it to the work. Like, do you feel like the work of political polarization or depolarization is related to that sort of whole of meaning within culture? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, the foundation of meaning in the human experience, I believe, derives from our, our connections to each other on the level of our relationships. Um, and you might, if you wanted to go a layer deeper, you might say our larger just sort of spirit of connection connection to reality within which humanity represents a key component for our for our lived experience, right? Um, but what the work of depolarization does, the deeper work of depolarization, which a superficial understanding of depolarization would define it as the sort of tamping down of, of hostilities, affective depolarization, so personal, the personal uh, polarization. A superficial look at that would look at it as sort of a moderating of, of hostilities to create the space for, for civil dialogue, right? But a deeper understanding of what sustains the etiquette of civility, and it's why I don't actually use the term civility very much, because I see it as, as a, a, a positive, you know, good, but not a deeper one. Um, I see it as a reflection of deeper goods and sort of a, a barometer of the health of other uh, virtues uh, in society. Thus, the deeper work of depolarization is the work of building out the fabric of community in our lives. And, you know, the word community, of course, the, the root of that is uh, commune. And that in and of itself has a religious connotation, the idea of communion, this idea that we come together um, 
and sync up with each other across the deeper levels of our intuitive and visceral connections with one another. And that can only be profound in a positive and uh, sort of, you know, uh, evolutionary uh, sense in, in terms of the context of our lived experiences individually and collectively, if it is the case that our deeper intuitive resonance with each other is resonance. In other words, we have to have a deep felt harmony of understanding with each other that allows for us to see the good in each other as being reflected in the good in ourselves and vice versa. And to see that, that raw potential for goodness reflected in the very sort of state of being human, right? If we can come to that essential conviction which is what is really preserved in in phraseology like you know we are endowed by our creator you know with certain inalienable rights etc cetera, etc cetera, and that all men are created equal this idea of being a child of god um it what that preserves is the starting conviction that the mere condition of being human means that there is something redeemable in you doesn't mean that we're going to get there it doesn't mean that you're not going to you know, be a psychopath perhaps, and, you know, ultimately be unavailable to moral, moral persuasion or, you know, what have you. But uh, it does mean that as uh, kind of the, as the, as the edifice for social architecture, that commitment to recognizing the mutual dignity of man, you know, it, it has to find itself, I think, at the heart and root of depolarization work if it is to be effective in an enduring way over time um, because depolarization of a sustainable kind has to rest upon the strength of relationships. And so this, by the way, uh, is at the heart of the philosophy of nonviolence, which I very much consider myself to be an adherent of. This is at the heart of the philosophy that Martin Luther King Jr. was an active proponent um, of, and somebody who developed that way of thinking and acting um, in the world. You know, it starts with the idea that by virtue of being human, you know, there is some, you know, some spark of the divine in us. So that, and in that, there is the, the uh, perpetual justification for operating in relationship to others from a starting point of goodwill, of felt goodwill. King would have used the word love, uh, agape love specifically, right? Which is not a love of affection. It is not a liking of somebody else. It is not a romantic attachment to be certain, but it is an overarching intention to act in a way that seeks the good of not just you yourself and not even the people who, uh, who you are standing up on behalf of, but also of the person who disagrees with you or even the person who hates you or who is actively opposed to you, right? And so, you know, theoretically, again, uh, it's possible that we can build such a culture um, from within a framework that is, you know, ultimately secular, but I think it would still need to metaphorically embrace these different, these different tools. And the figure of Christ himself in the center of that seems to me fairly indispensable because, um, and I, I'm speaking not just, I'm not, spe I'm not speaking in the immediate context of fostering, you know, depolarizing political debates and what have you, but I, I mean over the longer arc of the evolution of human society, even if Christianity is an organized religion falls by the wayside at, at some point in the way that we've known it, even if a, a metaphorical pathway for incorporating these things is what emerges as predominant over time, um, part of what the figure of Christ represents as an archetype, actually perhaps at the core of it, is this full sort of embodying of the ethos of goodwill and the act of loving your neighbor as you love yourself in a way that suggests that one a figure such as Christ in this narrative is one who has who has fallen so deeply in agape love with humanity that everything that pains some portion of humanity um, is a is a pain to him. But what it stimulates in him is a way of interacting. With 
with humanity to where every truth that he speaks, he is speaking to achieve some phenomenological uplift in the internal life of the other human being, right? So a lot of times we'll take a certain conceit upon ourselves as intellectuals in particular and so forth. There's a certain joy that we may take in owning somebody else in a debate. And then we might justify um, that, that polemic by saying, look, I, I, I said what was true and there's a moral justification in speaking the truth. And there is, but it brings us back to this division uh, or to this tension, I should say, not division, but this tension between the truth as stated in, in sort of a raw epistemological observation and the truth that is conveyed in the spirit of the, inter in, of the interaction being undertaken. Because if it is important for us to know the truth, it is important for me to speak truth to you in a way that perhaps honors facts. But on the other hand, uh, if I speak facts to you in a way that do not allow you to actually hear those facts because the deeper tones of my communication have stated something underneath the, the articulated fact, which is the deeper fact that I am stating this fact to denote a division between you and I within which I am achieving my well-being at your expense because for you I have disdain, right? You know, all of that is being is being not most of that is not being articulated, but all of that is being said, right? And so you have to take the unstated layer there as part of the larger truth statement that comes across even in our straight across sort of epistemological debates. And, and when you come to recognize all of these things as existing within kind of, as you come to recognize every statement as composed of that which is articulated and that which is not, but nevertheless conveyed, that which is implied in the, under, in the undercurrent of truth as it is stated, then we start to develop an understanding of what, what sort of the what spirituality in communication actually is. And, and again, it, it may be that that is something that can actually be abstracted or um, sort of uh, salvaged from, and maybe Brett, maybe Brett Weinstein would, would, would agree with this, I, I'm not sure. Um, but part of what Brett and, and other folks have uh, talked about are the evolutionary uh, advantages that uh, religion uh, affords that we should be in the habit of trying to sort of appropriate into our secular understanding of the world while divorcing from the sort of, you know, empirically or, or sort of unscientific structures of religious kind of ideation that hold us back in other areas. It may be we can take on a way of understanding communication that incorporates the spiritual component without tethering us to uh, the superstitions of religion, if you will. I'm very much, I'm open to that, right? But the key point here is just that our appreciation of what truth is and what it means to speak truth has to carry with it the moral dimension of spirit and of virtue, right? And this is why nonviolence was a powerful philosophy because it was, it was more than intellectual sort of abstraction. King lived this as best he could speaking the moral truth to people in a way that also implied the moral truth of agape love that carried each of his political and polemical uh, points of view. And that ultimately inspired a shift in the cultural and the moral imagination and felt experience of the nation that has delivered us to a point today to where even though we're sitting here in the midst of all of these uncertainties and social chaos, you know, predominate, so on and so forth. King ultimately delivered us so much closer uh, to the realization, to a higher realization and a higher understanding of even the, the classical liberal sort of dream, if you will, uh, because in, re in refortifying the bonds of felt goodwill between humanity, he made it easier for us to transcend our tribal categories and thus to arrive at deeper consensus, uh, consensus uh, over what a what a an optimal uh, future of flourishing might look like uh, for humanity in the context of democracy, in the context of community, 
um, in the context of our institutions and our broader social life, right? And so uh, you can look at King as, in many respects, being a a small l liberal sort of figure in that way. Uh, his crusade was at least harmonious with the founding principles of this country and a larger humanistic project, but it was given moral volition through this spiritual vocabulary and through a deep adherence to the spiritual implications of the theology from which he was operating and, um, and the spiritual truths that were passed down to him uh, in the philosophy of nonviolence, right? And so take those things out. If all we have are our clever arguments today, you know, um, does that not dramatically disempower us in our ability to repair social divisions in an age where, uh, and, and to uplift what you, what you said at the beginning of, of my current uh, ramble here, uh, in an age where so much of our social division stems from a void of meaning in life, mm-hmm. I think, wherein our connections to one another have been in many respects severed uh, or diluted and our suspicions of one another have been amplified. Mm-hmm. I think that we need those pieces um, one way or another. And I wanted to, to have uh, just one last question returning to the, the question of, of mediation and uh, conversations across the divides. What do you think is the end goal? What do you think is a realistic end goal? I've heard some people say, well, ultimately mediation, we want to be to get it to the point where you um, like, like a civil dinner with an ex rather than a kind of complete rapprochement where you kind of become best friends, that we can just get along to the point where we um, tolerate each other rather than, or, or do you have more lofty ambitions? Do you think it's possible to go further than that? Well, like I said, I think that the deeper work of depolarization has to be a reforging of the bonds of community in American life. Granted that the very sort of, you know, structure of community has begun to change radically as, you know, suddenly, you know, the idea of there's no simple segregation between local community and, you know, being community with people on the other side of the country or even the world as technology has given us quick access to each other, so on and so forth. Um, But I think that in general, uh, the hope is to be able to set a cultural context for us to be in deeper relationship with each other. And that goes beyond just being able to survive a dinner table conversation, um, you know, with your mother-in-law over politics or religion. Uh, Now, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that it is my expectation or even my, you know, even my intention necessarily for every person who engages in a Braver Angels workshop to suddenly become like Gandhi or King. That's that's, you know, that's asking, that's asking too much. Um, you know, we have a variety of tools that we offer. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, many people will participate in a workshop of ours, learn some things that do allow them to get through the next Thanksgiving dinner. And that's a victory for them. And that's also a victory for society. Because every interaction we have, you know, triggers a butterfly effect. And, you know, who knows what the implications of even the smallest um, constructive uh, um, back and forth might be. But um, many folks who engage with us at Braver Angels uh, become a part of, of the community that Braver Angels is building directly across America. I mean, I mentioned our members, I mentioned our various local alliances, our presences on college campuses and local communities. And, you know, we've got our small but growing online following, et cetera. And of course, our organization exists within the space of other organizations and institutions that are doing and supporting uh, similar work. Um, I think that there is a vision for social progress that I have, which certainly includes wanting to be impactful in the larger narrative streams of of American life, and indeed that is you know, vitally important, but that also has everything to do with maintaining the depth and the integrity um, of relationships that exist within even a relatively small community 
such as ours that is made up of heterodox individuals from across not just the political but the religious and social and ethnic landscape and so forth um trying to diversify all the time um that allows a on a percentage level perhaps very small but still uh, increasingly um growing community of americans to model um the dimensions of a communal landscape that is wholly rooted in this, whether metaphorically or not, teleological kind of encasement of our understanding of our interdependent uh, relationships with each other, both materially and uh, socially and psychologically, that becomes visible over time uh, enough to where it may begin to influence through its visibility and through its, um, through its, um, echoing throughout the cultures of our surrounding institutions, um, a model by which the larger society uh, that we live can begin to become influenced by and um, find itself maybe in some respects orienting its culture around. We have to be able to demonstrate community if we are going to inspire community, you know, just like we have to be able to demonstrate goodwill between individuals if we were going to show individuals their own personal pathways towards living life in that way. And so even as we try to impact the larger conversation, we are still trying to model uh, the type of society that we would like the larger conversation to become an ally in helping all Americans build, right? And so that's my deeper hope is that we can see this, this heterodox community um, within the intellectual dark web space or what that's evolving into within the depolarization space, within the larger landscape of Americans and people around the world who are operating from a posture of goodwill, who find themselves heirs to noble uh, philosophical, moral, and religious uh, traditions and to the best aspects of those traditions, whether you're a classical liberal or a Burkean conservative or a Christian or uh, an enlightenment, um, you know, um, uh, somebody who's, who's rooted in the precepts of the enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a, a deep moral synthesis across the uh, domains of, of the, American, uh, the American community, I think is, even if captured on a relatively small scale, is what will allow a larger cultural shift to scale dramatically, you know, over the course of time. And um, so that's, that is the project uh, uh, with which I am engaged. John, thank you so much for making the time. They're lofty ambitions, but I think this is the time where we need people with those lofty ambitions. So thank you. What else do I have to do? <laughs> thank you, man. This has been fun. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films. It's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q and A's with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our Wisdom Gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.